Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Steele, and uh, I'm going to try to do a series of videos that where I'm going to write on the whiteboard, and hopefully I will help you to be able to understand some concepts that I think are really important for you to know as you're going to be uh, continuing to counsel with people, uh, the people that God brings into um, your ministry. And today I want to talk about triggers. Triggers are um, something that I find I work with couples and individuals a lot with. Um, they are uh, emotions that come um, as a result of things that happen in our environment, things that people say to us, looks they give us, events that happen, and um, we're flooded with these emotions and it happens very spontaneously. Um, we haven't done anything, um, it happens instantaneously, but the problem is how, what people do with those triggers. And most people don't have a good plan to do something productive, and so it goes south on them. And they end up having problems because of uh, their inability to know what to do with their triggers. So I want to just kind of explain to you what happens when people get triggered so that you can understand it, you can help them to understand it, and then you can help them to come up with a plan of what they want to do when they get triggered. What we see in many secular uh, methods is actually what we call anger management. That is an attempt to help people to do something more productive with their triggers. But in anger management, there really isn't often an educational piece where um, they're taught what is happening to them right now and that it's very normal what's happening to them. But they also have to um, decide if they're going to react to the triggers or if they're going to learn how to respond in a productive way to the triggers. So let me unpack triggers a little bit. Okay, I'm going to draw a diagram that shows you the two sides of a trigger. So a trigger is going to happen, as I mentioned, it happens automatically. I'll give you an example, kind of a case study that we can uh, used to talk through this. Um, it might be something like the husband and wife um, are discussing whether or not the husband should buy a motorcycle. And the wife, they got three kids, and um, the wife works, the husband works, and the husband's going, hey, wouldn't it be fun if we had a motorcycle? We could ride places together, we could go on the weekends. Um, and she's thinking to herself, you know what? You know, our kids have so many activities on the weekends. When are we going to have time to ride this motor motorcycle? And she's also thinking to herself, you know what? This motorcycle, he's going to spend money that we don't necessarily have. We have other needs besides uh, just his need that, that he has for a motorcycle. And so he's trying to, con excuse me, trying to convince her that buying a motorcycle is a good thing, not only for him, but for the rest of the family. So um, she's not really, you know, buying into it, and she's thinking to herself, you know, it's dangerous. She's thinking that, you know, it's going to end up where he might actually, someone will hit him, and he could die, and then where is she going to be left with three kids? She doesn't want to be alone. She doesn't want to be a single uh, mother. Um, and so he feels this resistance. And so he's thinking, well, she just doesn't really care about me. She's just really more concerned about her own needs than she is about me. You know, I work hard. I deserve a motorcycle. And so he says, you know what? I'm going to buy a motorcycle whether you like it or not. Well, them are fighting words. So let's think about what happens with her when he says, I'm going to buy a motorcycle whether you like it or not. Okay? Well, she's going to have negative thoughts about him. She's going to say, think to herself, he is selfish. He is a poor decision maker. And I could go on and on with the negative thoughts that she's going to have about him. And then what kind of emotions is she going to be experiencing? Well, of course, negative emotions. She's going to feel like she is not cared for. She's going to feel a sense of abandonment.
And she's going to then, in her actions, which are also going to be negative, more than likely, she will um, withdraw from him emotionally, detach from him. And as soon as she tells him something like, you know what, you're selfish, I think you're a poor decision maker, he gets triggered, he goes into the same process, and then you have two people who are sleeping in different rooms. Couples, as a general rule, have patterns. Sometimes, you know, you have couples who will say, you know what, we never go to bed, um, we don't let the sun uh, go down on our anger. You have other couples that it may be three days, you have other couples that might be a week. But when you have two people who are withdrawn from each other and they're disconnected from each other, automatically they're going to have the need, I believe it's a God-given need, to try to reconnect with one another. And so the, the issue is how do you get them from here, which is a very dark place, call it the darkness, into a more connected place that I call the light. And I have this kind of squiggly line here that I call the veil. And when I think about this veil, I think about in Old Testament times where in the uh, temple um, where you had the Holy of Holies, there was a veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. And we know that when Jesus died on the cross, that that um, veil actually was torn. And so we have to, it's just kind of a, a metaphor of getting from the darkness into the light. And of course, with the light, the thoughts that the individuals have are going to be positive. The emotions are going to be positive. And the actions are going to be positive. People want to be connected with each other. God created us to be connected with each other. He created us to be connected to Him. People automatically are going to want to get to the light. Automatically their thoughts are going to be changing to where they're going to have more positive thoughts about each other. She's going to be thinking, you know, he does work hard. He does provide for the family. He does care for me. He cares for his children. He even saved money on gas if he uses a motorcycle. And then she's going to feel like uh, she wants to be in a relationship. She's going to draw closer to him as she has these thoughts that bring about emotions of um, feeling like, yes, he does care for me, and no, he would never abandon me. He hasn't so far. He, he's never even intimated that he's going to abandon me. And then the two, as they're having these more positive thoughts, accompanied by more positive emotions, are going to reconnect. The problem is, when you have this type of situation happening too often, individuals find it harder and harder to try to reconnect with each other. And that's oftentimes what I'll see in my own practice, is that the individuals are having such a hard time reconnecting, they don't know if the marriage is going to make it, and they're desperate for help. And so I can, I can help them to understand what's going on with them, why this cycle continues time and time again, and to help them to develop some strategies that will actually keep them, um, get them to the place that very quickly they can go into uh, this positive place. And I, I want, would just like to um, challenge you to think about some Bible verses um, that talk about the attitude that we are supposed to have um, that will help people when, when they're in this journey People want to be in this place. They don't want to be over here. It's a place of despair. It's a place of aloneness. They want to be in this place where they feel connected. They feel 
um, like um, they're cared for and uh, they're able to care for the other person. So things that I teach people, some strategies would be, you know what? Take some deep breaths. Because as they're taking some deep breaths, they're not saying things that they're going to regret. Take a walk. Again, take the walk. Take some time to pray. Think about it. Take a time out. In other words, when you have, when you're triggered and you're in the heat of those emotions, the heat of those negative thoughts, you cannot have a conversation with your spouse. It's not a good idea. You need to have the conversation, but not right now. When you've been triggered, when when you are not going to say anything that's going to be productive. All three of these uh, strategies right here give you the time to get to this place where you're thinking more positive thoughts, you're thinking in a way that's going to be more productive for the relationship. And of course, it's not, I'm going to storm out of the, you know, out of the house. And it's, you know what, we need to take a time out. We need to take a little break. I'm going to go take a walk. When we come back, we'll, we'll continue this conversation. Or, you know what, we um, are not getting anywhere right now. Let's come back to it tomorrow. Um, and so those types of strategies actually work. Now, if it's not a couple relationship, maybe it's a relationship at work, or maybe it's with other family members, these types of strategies still continue to be very effective because no matter who it is that you're having um, these interactions with when these emotions are triggered, it's always a good idea to not react out of them. Um, and to recognize that there is a more productive response that's going to take place where, no, we may not agree at the end, but we're going to talk civilly about it. We're going to um, edify each other and we're going to edify God in the way that we go about um, dealing with the conflicts and the differences uh, in our lives. So that's it for uh, triggers. Uh, so I'm going to sign off and then I'm going to come back with some other issues that I would like to um, just kind of um, dissect and um, give you some new things to think about.